wink name. Ah, technology, technology. I love it. <laughs> Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produced groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 awards ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, via multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I'd encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, very nice to have all of you here part, being part of the Catalyst Change Week. Thank you very much for all of the, your participation. We are uh, starting now the panel about digital empowerment and systems changing technology uplift society. Uh, and Nathan, can, uh, do you like to share some of your thoughts uh, just uh, right before we start the session? You are on, on mute. There we are. So hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. So yeah, we're delighted here to share with you a series of stories that we've been developing for years based on people who have grown up in the favelas and have undergone recode pre pre programming training to rise out of poverty and uh, acquire jobs that have sustainable incomes for them and their families and then to also provide the same training for people from their neighborhoods to catalyze a community movement of lifting out of poverty and having digital access to modern society and modern social tools for uh, galvanizing systems change from the ground up. So Rodrigo, do you want to mention um, who will be with us today uh, from those stories? Uh, yeah, sure. 
So um, we, uh, so I think we are uh, important to say, Nathan, about uh, this uh, collaboration uh, in between Recode uh, and the Academy for uh, Systems Changing uh, that uh, Peter leading in MIT. And uh, we're gonna share a little bit more about what we did together, but also we have with us Constance. Uh, Constance work uh, as a, uh, one of the um, uh, directors or C-level or, uh, or vice president of Ashoka uh, and running the operations in the United States, but also running the Technology for Humanity, which is a, a, a group of Ashoka fellows that are working with technology. Also, she will have uh, this great opportunity to share some of her experience with these tech social entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, Nathan, what, what do you think about we, uh, we starting sharing uh, more about uh, the idea of this partnership and so, and just start, because I'm, I'm not sh seeing here uh, uh, some of our uh, the tech change makers. And I think we need, we, 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 we need to talk about the stories. What, what do you think? Can you go in this direction? Sure. No, that's fine. So I've been writing stories that cover climate change, deep social systems change for the Academy for Systems Change, which is now evolving into the Center for Systems Awareness at MIT for a long time now, for many years. And Rodrigo and I first began talking about this partnership back in 2020, as the pandemic was actually just achieving its zenith. So we were all siphoned off into our little corners of the world, thinking about how we could make these stories, how we could make them in new, very visceral, gripping ways that had evocative narratives with real character arcs, with real character development that brought people into the world of transformation that these people had undergone, and then equipped them with the social skills to help others do the same. So the stories are in a state of evolution, just as the work is in a state of evolution. And I see the emerging partnership now that we're hoping to shift more towards the Center for Systems Awareness at MIT as being one that kind of does two things. It really tells the particulars of these journeys because each journey is completely unique um, and it really honors those details. And that's what invites the reader in both from a learned practitioner's audience, but also from a lay audience. And it also exposes themes, transferable themes of systems change that we can abstract from these stories. We can see commonalities in the journeys by which we can start to create theories of systems change, what has worked on the ground, what hasn't worked on the ground, what's led to systemic solutions that may make things a little bit worse for a time while people get used to their new abilities, but make things better over time, as opposed to symptomatic fixes, which tend to do the opposite. So growing systemic solutions from within the community endogenously in that way, um, which takes many things, which takes a lot of openness, which takes a lot of awareness, which takes a lot of courage to confront kind of the deepest personal obstacles to systems change, because real systems change is just the personal change writ large. So it's my goal that this partnership will really start to show more and more common threads of those kinds of archetypal journeys. Wonderful. So, Peter, uh, what do you think about you uh, about you share some of uh, your experience uh, with digital empowerment, with CDI and Recode, uh, just starting uh, sharing your thoughts about uh, how technology could uh, accelerate and change in, in our society? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, Rodrigo and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, it gets after a while, you don't know how long. It's just been a long time. Uh, and I think I first visited uh, some of the favelas with Rodrigo probably 15 years or more ago in, in Rio. And I was so taken by uh, the way he had kind of crafted a very interesting approach, which clearly uses technology. It, it really uses technology as a vehicle for connection, but also connecting locally. I mean, this is the paradox of technology. We get connected globally, but we're not connected locally. And at some level, all real change is local. It's it's us, it's here, it's connecting people and people to place. Um, so uh, I remember when we visited the first favela, we, we of course visited a lot of the people who were recode uh, in the recode program at that time. But we also visited a, a, a center, a community center hosted by a lady who probably was in her 60s or 70s. She wasn't kind of your image of a tech or uh, digital entrepreneur, 
but she was really credible in the community. And she had kind of built a center uh, where people could come together, get connectivity and get connected to each other. So to me, that's always been the special kind of, uh, the special feature of, of Recode, this combination of connecting in the way we normally think about it with digital empowerment, but also connecting locally. And I do think both are equally important and the consequences for some of the people I've met have been really wonderful. Peter, uh, I, I'm just reconnecting with this visit that you are mentioned. I, I think it was in the, in the Morro dos Macacos, the Monkey Hill, uh, one of the uh, very violent uh, uh, um, uh, favela or slum in Rio de Janeiro. And we went there with you and also I think the, the CEO, the global CEO of Unilever, right? Or, I think there was a, someone from Unilever with us. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but yes, either yeah. then or later. Yeah, and then we start an open dialogue with former drug dealers and people that had their life changing uh, through the good use of technology. Things that uh, CDI and Recode we are doing for the last uh, 20, uh, 28 years who have been uh, impacted directly 1.8 million people uh, mm -hmm. in 12 countries who have almost 700 digital empowerment centers in all of Brazilian states and with all of these publics. But uh, I think when we was there, uh, uh, I, uh, the highlight was see uh, these testimonials of the power of technology change lives and make, for example, former drug dealer change their lives and become a role model in the community, right? And and, and this is really uh, something that uh, that was very special. And I think when uh, uh, you in the, your uh, uh, center for uh, syst uh, system, what's the name of the center, Peter? System chain, uh, system uh, yeah, there's a Center for Systems Awareness is actually a nonprofit that's independent. And then there's a new Systems Awareness Lab at MIT, which is just still starting. And I think when we produce these stories, uh, I think our vision is amplify the voice and share for more people. And it would be great if we can uh, hear Susanna and Elaine uh, as one of, of the next steps uh, after the, this uh, panel is maybe we can share these stories for Catalyst and, uh, and also with Ashoka, right, Constance? Uh, Ashoka, uh, I think all of you know about Ashoka is the organization that creating the gravitational center for social entrepreneurship and Bill Drayton founded in shock, I think 30, almost 35 years, right? Or 40 years, Constance. And it would be really great if you can share uh, with us uh, your perspective about uh, social tech, social entrepreneurs and your experience with Ashoka fellows that are working with technology to changing hum humanity. Yeah, thank you so much, Rodrigo, and uh, glad to be here and uh, ch chime in. And actually, it starts, I think, with you and I meeting how many years ago? It was like almost 20 years ago, I think, because um, you were probably the first social entrepreneur in tech I met. And uh, and, you know, but it was back in the day when uh, the code didn't exist, it was CDE, and it was, uh, you know, about, um, you know, your work bridging the digital divide and, uh, you know, what we heard from, from the other speakers. What I thought, or what I'm thinking now from sort of a bird's eye perspective is what is so, you know, exemplary about what, you know, you are doing, other social entrepreneurs are doing is this role that social entrepreneurs play in terms of, you know, seeing unintended consequences early, you know, in, 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 in your case, it was the digital divide, right? You were talking about this in the 1990s when that wasn't a topic at all. So seeing that early and then starting to build, um, to build forward in ways that mitigate, you know, that unintended consequence. And, um, and perhaps another, uh, you know, pattern that stands out looking at your work and the work of many other Ashoka fellows and Catalyst members across the world is, um, uh, you know, a key element of systems change. I think that you were all alluding to this belief in people as being inherently powerful, right? Mm -hmm. There's this uh, sort of 
seeing you know the 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 strength and the assets rather than the weakness so you wouldn't say oh you know they live in the favela they're poor they had a past as a drug dealer therefore i'm not going to go with them you know but you see the entrepreneurial instincts the creativity the power and then you you build on that and so that's also that is also um a key pattern and um and i think the other uh the other aspect for now worth mentioning perhaps is also this understanding that all technology is human right that it's not you cannot do tech solutionism right you cannot solve a problem just by dumping tech somewhere but it's always about you know tech in the hands of communities the interaction between technology and human fabric and uh and you know what you create around that, um, which matters, and where the focus needs to be, rather than just on the coding and, and, and programming um, part. So yeah, these would be my thoughts. Right, and and I think when we uh, we met, you was starting the uh, a shock in Germany, right? Yes, a very that was successful country that uh, leading Europe uh, uh, and very important. But I think that moment, Constance. Uh, the challenge was democratizing the third industrial revolution, democratizing computers and internet. And what we are saying, and what uh, for me is very inspiring in Ashoka creating this community of tech and human humanity, is now the challenge is the humanization of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, is how do we can implement and put ethics and values uh in the uh, in this amazing acceleration of artificial intelligence and the and this right. fourth industrial revolution uh, uh Correct. it's really critical right and yeah I, th I think you're right Rodrigo. and i think there's also this you know as you're saying it these two aspects one is using technology for good right but the other aspect is making technology good or as you said it you know sort of ensuring that humanity human values regulate the use of, of, of tech. And I think in both areas, you know, social entrepreneurs like yourself and others have been really pathbreaking and, um, and are needed more than ever because that's our full-time job, right? To think about that <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and to come up with, with new ways to regulate these systems. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing seeing in The Economist this week, Yuval Harari uh, suggesting the creation of a kind of food and drug administration uh, for the global level uh, and working for with artificial intelligence, right? And uh, Peter, uh, I think it uh, will be really amazing to talk about our experience with Umberto Maturana and connecting this perspective of, about biologies in, in this uh, in this discussion. But before of that, I would like to ask in Robert, because Robert is with us, I would like to to, to listen to uh, some thoughts from you, Robert, about what your perspective about this, this uh, subject. Oh, well, there's uh, so it's, it's interesting. I sometimes come into these meetings and I'm not quite sure why I'm here. Then you played, number one, your introduction. And number one, I, I really do love music <laughs> it hits the heart and the emotions and it's just not you know content and then i see jeru i sit on a board of the collective change lab with jeru so it's sort of like jeru anyway I, it's a really interesting connection uh there uh and um uh believe it or not my my career or a good part of my career started like in the mid 70s with becoming a programmer uh, and, you know, taking organizations, this was a natural food company, and computerizing it, and I, I realized the, the technical part wasn't, it, it, that was the easy part in a way, right? Uh, uh, it was the human part. It was people kind of coming into a context in which they were afraid they wouldn't be able to change, uh, you know, and being able to help facilitate that. I, I read a quote this morning, uh, it was a young quote, very interesting. It's, I am not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it just it catalyzed that sense. And, you know, to kind of connect that just for a moment to Umberto, um, a lot of what Umberto did was really bring humans to it. He was a remarkable theoretician. Uh, but he went beyond theory to actual experiences with people of really being able to connect and collaborate. Um, and, uh, 
and, and to be able to kind of find and dissolve their kind of negative stories, you know, th th their negative patterns. So they're able to do it. And when I was reading what you guys were doing um, in Catalyst, I was just amazed and blown away by the fact that you are, and, and very importantly, combining the two, uh, you know, really kind of helping to build and dissolve negative narratives, bring people into a place where they can actually grow and change and learn. So uh, for me, it was quite amazing. It connected many of those elements together. And by the way, one last thing is, uh, I want to, you know, we're talking a little bit about AI, you know, AI doesn't mean there's no I, <laughs> there's no intelligence. Uh, and um, and I think there's that, and, you know, rather than superficially, what I've been reading lately is um, AI, a lot of AI is description and prediction, not explanation. You know, the, it, it doesn't cover everything. It doesn't really cover the depth of human capability to be able to understand systemically what's going on and that reality is emergent. Uh, uh, so um, I think it's both ethics, you know, as you're talking about and boundaries and so forth, but it, you know, intelligence really still plays a very big part. Uh, in being able to, um, you know, create the kinds of uh, results we want in our cultures and societies. Robert, did you mention, uh, you talk also about Umberto. Oh, everyone here are familiar with Umberto Maturana and why we are talking about him here. Umberto Maturana is, uh, um, he passed away, but he was one of the biggest uh, biologists uh, in our planet. He creating the concepts like the organiz autopoietic or, uh, organism. And Peter, do you like to introduce a little bit some of the ideas of uh, Umberto? And uh, I think yeah. you are the best person to do that. Thanks, Rodrigo. Well, Umberto was a very important teacher for many of us. Uh, and many of us here got uh, had the privilege of spending time with him. He was very unusual because, you know, he comes out of a mainstream Western scientific tradition. He got his PhD at Harvard. He did very important postdoctoral research at MIT uh, on perception and famous research on how a frog sees what's the nature of perception. Uh, but it was in a very reductionistic mode because it was mainstream scientific research, which another way to say that is you kind of reduce the human or the living system to a type of sophisticated machine. It's, it's so interesting. We're all very focused on artificial intelligence right now, but I think we don't really have a very good idea of what intelligence actually is. And the only way we can really understand intelligence to some degree is we have to understand humanity. So Humberto developed some fascinating ideas that kind of bridged from traditional biology, and I'll just say Western science, to uh, a very much deeper, more human-centered uh, notion of biology. For example, he was one of the first biologists to write about the biology of love. And he's talked about love as a biological phenomenon. He talked about cognition, not just as uh, the way psychologists had talked about cognition, but cognition as a property of living systems, that all living systems have ways of building awareness and interacting with their environments so that they can live. So he kind of took us to a much deeper level that at this point in time, and it is ironic I would say almost, it's almost like a science fiction theme as the, quote, artificial intelligence accelerates and becomes so dominant. We really don't have any choice if we want to have a future that we'll want to live in of not also accelerating and deepening our understanding of human intelligence. What does it mean to be a human being? Uh, Humberto made this beautiful point, for example, that uh, in the history of evolutionary biology, this is a big deal. It's called the opposable thumb, right? And uh, only we humans and the bonobo chimps have an opposable thumb. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to grasp. So this species develops as a tool user. That's kind of the mainstream view of evolutionary biologists. But Umberto made an additional point. He said, the, this also allows us to caress. Mammals have a very rich social life, but this species caresses. And, and so the understanding that he was able to help us all under to, to build is really all pointing in this common direction. What does it mean to really be a human being fully? Because if we can't be a, fully, a human being fully, 
we will not be able to have a human-centric artificial intelligence because we won't even know what we mean. Excellent, yeah. And, um, and Nathan, um, you remember when we watched during three days in Chile with Humberto and the Escuela Matrisica and Peter, right? And we, uh, uh, and what's really amazing talk with Humberto about the power of dig digital inclusion or digital empowerment for someone that uh, he was at that time a very low tech, right? <laughs> and uh, but uh, but I think after three days he understood the the importance of technology for this group, the humankind, right? What what's your, what's your thoughts about these three days and the experience with with Humberto? Well, the construct of Umberto's that's always resonated with me and which I have taken with me since those wonderful days in Santiago was his or his concept of the coevolution of organism and niche. So it was a fluvial concept by which, you know, any species adapts to the modulations underway in its environment. Um, and that without that continual sensorial apparatus by which they stay attuned to the environment and continue modulating with the environment's changes, that species is, is doomed. And for humanity, we're in this in interesting predicament because our niche in some way, whether for better or for worse, has kind of become the entire planet. So now we're having to evolve not only with a niche that's incredibly aggregated and complex, but a niche to which we are contributing explicitly to its modulations. So now, because of anthropogenic climate change, which is completely undisputable at this point, because other than that, we would be in a cooling period, actually. The orbital mechanics of the Earth work out that we would be slightly cooling if it wasn't for humanity. So we're contributing to the very changes that we're racing as a species to adapt to. And Umberto was very clear that without that capability of ongoing adaptation, we wouldn't make it. So through that conversation, it kind of became implied. I don't remember if he actually ever explicitly stated this, that technology would be really indispensable in that quest to co-evolve with the overall change of the earth that we were in some ways manifesting. Because it was really a question of wielding it ethically, of course, but also just speed of ad adaptation. You know, unless humanity is going to fracture off into a bunch of tribes and evolve with specific niches, like we have in our whole evolutionary past, in which if we can't get our act together, we may be headed that way. We did it for tens of millennia. Um, the only way to evolve in bulk was with the assistance of, of technology. And there was one other point, um, Robert, I just wanted to piggy tail off of something you had said, um, about wielding AI, not so much the ethical dimension, but the practical dimension. When we were just at MIT at the Ideas Asia Pacific uh, group meeting of nine countries represented from the Asia Pacific region who are engaged in deep systems change, something they had all spoken to on the concept of AI was the importance of prompts, that AI has to be governed by good leading delimited prompts because otherwise AI in its current state will kind of rove and the technical term is actually hallucinate. It won't know what to say. It will search for information. So it has to be stewarded by us. And that re-enters the ethical dimension. It has to be stewarded by a place from which we're operating to try to assist our evolution for everyone. And that's part of the empowerment is to bring everyone into that evolutionary conversation. So they're not isolated in impoverished environments from which they can't do anything except just try to survive. Right, excellent, and and I think uh, 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 when I, I remember one of the insights that Umberto had uh, when we talk about digital inclusion, digital empowerment, is uh, somehow he comparing the humankind with technology as a, a planetary uh, ant uh, place. Uh, uh, and do you remember that, Peter? This is, a, I think, a very sophisticated vision, like uh, 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 the humankind with a uh, good use of technology could changing themselves in a kind of galaxy or planetary uh, uh, ants, collective of ants. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a natural metaphor for a biologist because, you know, ants are very intelligent collectively. And you'd say right now, uh, humans are very intelligent individually. 
but we're not very intelligent collectively. No species would constantly, just co consciously destroy the niche that their living depends upon, which is exactly what we're doing with destroying species and uh, eradicating the critical ecosystems in the ocean and on the land. And obviously climate change is kind of one big, big example of this. So the idea that our, our, our possibility for the future, our, literally our survival, depends on developing a kind of collective intelligence, which you see in species like ants. Um, but which harmonizes the collective and the individual. Obviously, we've developed as a very individuated species. The dominant Western culture, Eurocentric culture, is almost by definition uh, distinct from many other cultures by being hyper-individualistic and hyper-masculine. The two tend to go together. Um, so yeah, Umberto really felt that in this kind of journey of the, what he used to call the biosphere and the technosphere, if there's any real rapprochement or integration in the future, it'll have to come from this species becoming more and more collectively intelligent. And none of us know, of course, but it's pretty hard to imagine that happening without there a different type of interplay with the technosphere or technology. Yeah, and, and Peter, I would love to explore more this um, merge about, about humans and technology, this transhumanism. And it would be great, Robert, if uh, see uh, your perspective on that. But before, uh, before I would like to ask him, uh, for uh, Constance, uh, if you, Constance, um, could share with us two or three examples of Ashoka Fellows that are using technology uh, as the way to impact uh, the world. So it would be really great if you could share two or three examples of uh, Ashoka Fellows that are working with technology, um, uh, and just uh, to share for all of us uh, some of these uh, um, examples. And after that, uh, it would be great, Robert, learn from you your comments about transhumanism in this moment that the humankind will be uh, uh, connecting or merge with technology. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo. I, I will. And then also allow me to elaborate quickly on what uh, was just said on the aspect of human and artificial intelligence. Um, so perhaps, you know, in, in a nutshell, I mean, obviously this Recoda and CDE and what you guys are doing and this aspect of perhaps centering technology on individuals to unleash their change-making power is uh, really well illustrated, for instance, by an example out of Spain and Latin America called Autofabricantes. It um, centers um, the experience of children with disabilities, um, you know, for instance, with including with missing, let's say, missing limbs, missing arms, missing hands, and allows them to construct the gadgets and the devices they need on an open source platform and then print it out, you know, for very, very little money at home. And it makes their life easier in terms of, you know, playing ping pong, flip, sort of reading books, whatever it is they want, which, you know, in the standard um, sort of market for, you know, that tends to serve these children, you know, these things don't exist because, they are not being asked, you know, what they need. And so the market gets disrupted by bypassing all the industry, going directly at the customer, centering them, you know, with the help, obviously, of therapists and engineers and experts and sort of creates, you know, um, uh, allows them to create what, what, what they need. So that is one example. A totally different example that moves us into the realm of, you know, tech and human interaction, for instance, would be Kharia Khatib. Um, Mnemonic is the organization in um, Europe, and it's looking at creating archives of safe archives where eyewitness accounts, both audio and video from, let's say, war-torn torn regions are being stored so they can be made available for historians and politicians and, you know, um, and, and prosecutors and the likes. They're being saved and archived in order to investigate, um, you know, war crimes and uh, other atrocities. 
and they're being vetted and verified. And why that is a systems change thing is for two reasons. One, I mean, we all know about deep fake and, and fake news and so on circulating. But what's also happening is that, you know, social media platforms and their desire to sort of remove content, you know, deploy automatic algorithms that remove many images almost automatically that might be, you know, violent in terms of content, but might contain really, really important um, evidence of uh, historical evidence of what happened. And, um, and so the point here I want to make is that the machine in itself is not intelligent enough to understand the context, to understand the history, to understand languages, especially other than English. And so it does, in a way, what it has been programmed to do. But the, you know, when it comes to the, you know, subtlety and to the, you know, to the contextualized understanding and the complexity, you know, it, it's really where human intelligence and machine intelligence need to go together. And I think sort of, you know, projecting this um, onto the future, I mean, we, we know about generic uh, AI, chat GPT and all that, that, that is, uh, you know, rapid, rapidly, rapidly, rapidly accelerating. Um, you know, the question about how do we realign values and incentives so that the whole system works in the long run and doesn't just, you know, sort of feed into the short-term interests of the owners, I think is, is one of the key one of the key questions, and we can come come back to it. Perhaps you know one more thing. What I'm finding really interesting, as um, I'm an anthropologist by background, and people tend to forget that the machines basically are being trained on the world as it is, right? So all the injustices, all the you know power imbalances, etc., are being you know that's what it's being fed with and what it learns on. But still, we tend to think, oh no, they are more objective, you know, and sort of less biased than us, which obviously is not true because you know they learn on the world as it is. So that's another really interesting aspect which feeds into this you know necessity to really create you know as you say the right frameworks that align um, humanity and machines in the long in the long term. This is wonderful. Peter, do you like to add, to add something, some point, any other point? Well, I think that point that Constance just made about recognizing the machines learn based on the world as it is. And of course, uh, the, 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 the algorithms and the programming of the machines are a reflection of the assumptions of the people who do the programming, which is another aspect of the world as it is. Um, so I think that's a really uh, quite a profound point that, um, you know, in some sense, humans as a species advance through imagination. You know, this kind of strange capacity we have to really imagine something. It's a capacity that children are very, of course, strong in uh, that tends to get beaten out of them. School certainly is one vehicle for beating it out of them. And certainly most, most of the way the technology works today tends to not encourage development. If you think of it, artistic sensibilities grow from this innate capacity to imagine and create kind of universes in our own imagination. So I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, all the work we've done for years around vision and shared vision and the power of shared vision, you know, it's nothing more or less than an expression and a development of imagination. And it's a, it's a very deep philosophic question, but the, 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 that is not too important, but we can just sort of sit with the question, can machines imagine? Yeah. An interesting quick point to follow up on that is that can machines actually have the courage to imagine? Because one of the funny things that came out of one of my students at the University of Vermont who had humorously done his assignment twice, one himself and one by way of chat GPT, just for fun. And one of the first questions he asked chat GPT about was about bias, about surfacing bias. So you could clarify where the chat GPT bot was coming from. And the bot was quick to, to respond with a diffusing, um, oh, don't you worry, I've undergone extensive debiasing training. <laughs> I, I, I am, I'm clinically free of bias. So 
you know, again, that the, the old objectivist hubris, you know, that still plagues journalism yeah. to a certain extent, this idea that we're able to just transcend bias isn't the point at all. We're identifying biases so we can evolve them together. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This was actually a very, very important point for Umberto. One of the few times I ever saw him get really upset is when somebody <laughs> talked about, well, you know, this is all subjective. Everything you're talking about is subjective. And he said, oh, so you mean it's not objective? Yes, it's not objective. Oh, well, what's objective? And he went on. I mean, Humberto's whole work was about understanding perception, um, uh, awareness, what he eventually called cognition as a living phenomenon. And he said it is not possible for a living system to create an impartial or unbiased image of the external world inside. We interact with the world and we create something called awareness. Um, so the notion that we can be unbiased is a complete fiction. It is not possible for a living system to be unbiased because the living system is creating its own awareness. Um, so the idea that a machine can say, well, I'm not biased is probably true in a way because it's just reflecting its programming. But Umberto's whole point was it's a totally meaningless distinction, bias versus unbiased, because it rests on the assumption that there is a way to perceive reality perfectly, unbiased. And he said that 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 possibility does not exist except for a machine that is very limited by just recording data, but it can't make sense of the data except through its programming. So uh, this whole idea of bias was a very important idea for Umberto. In a way, it's one of the definitions of life, that we are imperfect. We cannot see reality. Therefore, we have this opportunity to continually learn. And the learning is always through connecting. So it kind of led full circle back to the importance of learning and the importance of learning together. So together, we see our our. our our biases through being in conversation with people who have different biases. And we say, oh, well, that person's wrong. They don't understand. Of course, that's what we see a lot in the divisiveness of present society. Well, those idiots, they don't really know what's going on. But what that's really reflecting is the fact that when living systems interact like humans, we encounter different imperfect presentations of reality. And through that, we can actually learn. And I mean, let me just uh, add uh mm -hmm. something here I, I, you really got me thinking i mean there's a i can't remember the exact definition but the from umberto but uh, fundamentally he was saying in the biology of love that language arose out of love mm -hmm. it was when two systems drifted together and interacted in a way that didn't destroy each other or one didn't destroy the other in a way that's almost you know my hope for technology uh, you know, it really, it, you know, in a, in a way, it's kind of expanding on language and ability to interact, you know, to be collectively intelligent. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the term proprioception, you know, proprioception is, you know, we have proprioceptors in our brain. We know when we touch ourselves, it's us touching it. We know, you know, kind of the impact we have on the world. I think part of collective intelligence is the capacity for collective proprioception. We're not, we, we may see our impact individually. But we seem to have a very difficult time understanding the impact, both intended and unintended, uh, collectively. You know, and perhaps technology is, a, you know, a form of language and connection that can begin to do that in so, a much wider way. That you know, it, we evolve differently than what we're kind of experiencing at this point. Anyway, just very interesting notions. Right, and I think we are here in the context of the Catalyzed Change Week. And this uh, amazing work that uh, this big coalition of social impact leaders are doing now in Catalyst 2030. Uh, so our challenge in us, uh, a movement is, uh, uh, we need to learn how to collaborate, working together and collaborate to accelerate SDGs. And it's really amazing also, uh, uh, if we can come back for uh, Shoka and Bill Drayton, and Constance, I remember talking uh, a lot with Bill about the future of social entrepreneurs mm. uh, uh, and see the Bill's vision, Bill's, uh, Drayton's visions about uh, 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 the future of social entrepreneurs is a kind of entrepreneurs that are able to collaborate. And he uh, mentioned the, 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 
uh, in, 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 for, in, in the way that he bringing this concept for us, he, he creating the, this word about synapses entrepreneurs. It's really a great inspiration to see Bill uh, looking at the future of uh, our field as a kind of synapses entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that working in collaboration synaptically. And this is really, uh, uh, this is really um, uh, wonderful. So now uh, you would like to open uh, for some questions. I'm seeing here Natalia. Hi, hola Natalia, que tal? Uh, Laura, Lara, Mike, do you have any questions for uh, or some comments that you'd like to uh, add in uh, here in our session? Hola, Rodrigo. So, do you have, so, any, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I am very impressed about EdTech right now and the lack of vision and values. Do you have any ideas on uh, Ashoka entrepreneurs working on EdTech that I should look into? Because um, unfortunately, the EdTech world has been um, covered by um, entrepreneurs that don't have a, a social enterprise mindset but more of a for-profit mindset and therefore we're doing the same mistakes in education that in edtech so uh, my motivation right now is to generate new uh, ideas and initiatives in the edtech world so any ideas please i'll be welcome to hear them thank you so much natalia um I, I, I can I follow up with you? I, I will put my email in the chat so you can follow up with me and I can um, I can give it some thoughts because yeah, I, I, I want to be intentional about how I how I respond to that. And it's it's an interesting field because you know, you when know I'm, when I'm oops, oops. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> can you mute yourself? Can you mute yourself? I, think I hear myself with an echo. Thank you. Um you know, because uh, yeah, it's such a such a broad field, you know, in a way, again, like say they introduced so much about sort of a new form of learning, you know, other social entrepreneurs like Mike, Mike Allison, uh, Mike Fierick with Allison introduced sort of the first open source sort of free learning university for the world. So they were, you know, spearheading uh, in, 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 in many ways. And now sort of about, as we said before, it's about both building and safeguarding, sort of building with tech for good, and then safeguarding humanity and ensuring tech works good. Um, there's also a lot of attention uh, being given to the underlying principles and the underpinning of ed tech, uh, you know, as, so that it comes with the right values and the right, um, and the right outcomes. So yeah, I'm happy to follow up with you on that. Nathan, it would be great if you could put in the chat uh, the link for these tech stories. And, uh, and it would be really great to see also uh, uh, if you would like to mention one or two or three examples of these tech stories uh, that could inspire us in this final moment of our session. Sure. Um, the story that comes to mind uh, most immediately is the story of Wanderson Scrock. Um, who was initially grew up in a favela as a gang leader, um, basically ensnared in a life of chronic fear and crime, uh, a life not of his choosing, a life he was simply born into. Um, and he actually went to juvenile prison for many years and then was released and then went back to that life and then went back to prison a second time. Now, during the second time in prison, he encountered the recode technology and he began to learn to program. And when he was released, he had already gone so far into his own programming development that he quickly earned enough credentials to begin teaching others. And now he talks very openly about these two lives that he has lived in near proximity to one another. And what's very striking about the former life that he talks about is just the chronic fear that he lived in. He just never had any mental bandwidth to do anything else except confront his fear on an immediate, recurrent, 
just incessant basis. He said he was so scared that he wouldn't even leave the favela to go to a mall. He was just in completely his whole life, every aspect of his life was just trapped within a completely isolated social community. And the antithesis of that was maneuvering beyond that, that community by way of technological integration. So once he was able to do that, he was able to connect with many of his own, his uh, former neighbors, even former people that were involved in his crime networks to show them that there's another way that you can integrate yourself into modern society and help others to do the same. And it's empowering. It's empowering in a way that you're not living in chronic fear and that you're living in a new state of volition. And he said, that was the big change in my life is that I suddenly felt like I had choice. I actually had agency again as a human being. So that story for me is very archetypal of many of the other stories, which all share themes of rising out of a life of, of continual defensiveness, always on, you know, always tensed for attack from any side to a state by which one can evolve in, in it is the right word, the luxury of choice. And that, that luxury should be endemic to human society. And that's part of what an endogenous community movement for me means, is making that, making that choice universalizable. So um, I think that story represents many of the others in a way, but one story that's a little different that I'll just mention, which is also in a state of development, is that there's another area these stories are drawing from, and that's um, Amazonas. So the indigenous peoples of the Amazon who also in a way have become isolated from modern society, also through um, chronic, chronic poverty, but of course coming from incredibly rich traditions, rich wisdom traditions by which they've lived in Humberto's language, successfully modulating with their niche for a very, very long time. But now the niche is evolving out of control because of things that they haven't done. So that's another constant theme is the indigenous communities, the ones who are not the culprits for climate change are the ones who are feeling its effects the loudest and the strongest and having to adapt to it the most immediately. And it actually resounds with another story I'm working with, with the Bajau indigenous people of South Sulawesi, Indonesia, who are actually after tens of millennia of evolving, evolving successfully in a maritime environment, a fishing climate on the islands of Indonesia, are now facing the prospect of having to move into the elevated interior of the island because of sea level rise, because their way of life simply isn't going to be tenable anymore. And it's remarkable the practicality with which they discuss this. There is certainly sadness in the conversation. I was recently privy to a conversation of Bajau tribal elders on this. There's certainly sadness in the reality, but there's also an amazing, astounding practicality Yep, the sea level is going to rise, fish diversity is going down, the soil is being eroded, we're going to learn how to hunt in the mountains. And that harkens back to an old quote from a Blackfoot tribal elder um, who I had the pleasure of, of dialoguing with back in 2006 from Alberta, um, Arnold of the Blackfoot Blood Tribe, who left me with a quote that I'll never forget which he said, you know, modern people are so worried about us. They're so worried about our social dynamics, about, you know, us being phased out of existence, about rampant alcoholism and things like that. They really don't need to worry about us. We'll be here long after you're gone. Nathan, it would be really great if you can put the link on the chat uh, for uh, people who have uh, more connection and we help uh, uh, Elaine, share the stories with Catalyst Brazil or Catalyst Global. And uh, I, I also, it, it's really nice, uh, your, you mentioned the story of Vanderson. Vanderson was with us here oh. uh, in this session. And it, it's really amazing. He Vanderson. still is, I think, Rodrigo. He still is. He is yes. here. Okay. I wasn't <laughs> sure. Great. Yeah, and and Vanderson, it's really amazing to see uh, you with your amazing story. Uh, and year, uh, two years ago, uh, when uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO, the global CEO of Microsoft, comes to Brazil, Microsoft invited you and Satya to share a stage and talk about the power of technology change lives for over one thousand businessmen. Right. So you and Satya working together uh, spread the awareness about the importance of digital empowerment. And, and also, uh, Nathan, it's really great you mentioned the Amazon. I'm here now in Amazon. And oh. uh, one of the stories that you, you are mentioning is 
the stories of the, the indigenous, the, the Wapi, uh, that creating a doc, a documentary in vir virtual reality 360, uh, give the voice of their gods talking about, uh, for our civilization, about the importance of climate change. And the leader of opposition in Brazil in that time take these uh, uh, VR documents from the YAP and bring in the COP in Europe to show uh, the voices of the gods of these indigenous talking about climate change. So powerful, we amplify this voice through these new technologies. So guys, we are the, at the end of our session and I would like to invite in, uh, Peter, Robert and Constance just to finish uh, with some thoughts or ideas or a sentence about uh, our uh, about digital empowerment systems changing uh, and technology uplifts the society. So thank you uh, all of you for your participation. Laura, you share in the chat about your initiative connecting farmers is really great. Uh, and thank you to join us. So uh, what do you think, uh, Robert, Constance and Peter, just the final ideas for our session? I would just say that I think, you know, Rico, even hearing you and like the stories now and how all of that was already there like 20 years ago, you know, when you started. So to see sort of how you pre-sensed, you know, the market and um, and where the world is going, I think just points to a really important faculty that social entrepreneurs have in terms of, you know, being the pre-sensor trend group of the future, to, so to say, to sort of, you know, uh, uh, alert all of us um, what is ahead and what we can do to harness the good. Yeah, I'll just, for me, it's, uh, this has just been a wonderful conversation and dialogue. I feel rejuvenated. <laughs> Uh, re-inspired. Uh, I'm noticing, you know, significant connections that I haven't seen before and new ideas. So uh, I guess mostly what I want to say is I'm grateful to have been part of this conversation, this group. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, I too, like uh, Consents, have been really interested in the in the arc of of your work, Rodrigo. And, um, I think the uh, the emergence of social entrepreneurship is obviously an important part of our age, but the problem is when you're with a lot of social entrepreneurs, you realize their lives are very difficult. They're isolated. They're stressed. They have, um, you know, I, I was in a gathering in New York with all these awards for all these very accomplished social entrepreneurs and talking with them in private, they mainly talked about their divorces, their families, all the sacrifices that they had made because they were passionate about their, their kind of innovation. And I think we, sh we need to recognize that again, in the end, uh, we are a social species. And the myth of entrepreneurship, which is so much driven, our tech growth in our modern economy is a myth of hyper-individualism. It's a very problematic myth. Uh, I, I really think that in ways it has the creative element, which is very exciting, the sense of responsibility, which we all love. But if it's not disconnected from the myth of the great individual, I fear that it will just reproduce more of what we have. So to me, again, it always comes back to this one word of connection and, and how in this next phase, this is not about a bunch of talented individuals, but people who are deeply connected to one another, their reality, and obviously the larger living systems, which in the end is our critical connection. Our first relationship is with Mother Earth. All other relationships suffer when that is not a solid connection. And that, of course, is the principle of almost all indigenous peoples. Thank you very much, Peter, for your final uh, thoughts and ideas. And thank you all for this uh, great uh, session. Thank you all for uh, your participation. And we're going to share uh, the recording of these sessions with Catalyst family. And now we need to go for the final session for the Catalyst Change Week. So thank you guys for all of your uh, participation. Love. Thank, thank you. you. It's nice to meet thank you. Thank you for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.